Hi everyone, welcome to today's snapshot session. The topic for today is improving security posture with Vault and AWS Lambda. My name is Jane and I'm a solutions engineer at HashiCorp. Let's begin with the agenda for today. We'll first talk about what the Vault Lambda extension is about. We'll dive a little deeper into how it works. And then I'll give a demonstration of it in action and leave you with some useful resources towards the end. Let's get started. What is the Vault Lambda extension? For those who are not familiar, AWS Lambda is a serverless environment that allows you to run applications as individual functions without having to provision or manage servers. These functions are usually short-lived as opposed to long-running services and can scale horizontally by running multiple copies as needed. Each function is generally designed to perform specific individual tasks on demand or in response to specific events. AWS released this new Lambda API called Extensions in October of 2020, which enables users to write code that integrates with the lifecycle of Lambda functions and run outside of the Lambda function invocation. Extensions can be notified before a function executes to perform pre-processing as well as execute in parallel to the invocation itself. Lambda Extensions is designed to be a way for you to easily plug in the tools you use today without complex installation or configuration management. Most customers will use the extensions without needing to know about the capabilities of the API that enables the extensions. You just consume, you just consume it by configuring certain options in your Lambda functions. Lambda functions commonly access external services. And it usually requires some form of secrets like credentials or tokens, which are typically stored in environment variables, it could be also hard coded in the function, or maybe retrieved with some extra code in the function. So if you store these secrets safely inside Vault, then the Vault Lambda extension allows your Lambda functions to take advantage of the various features of Vault together with your application code and inject secrets into it, such as static API keys or dynamic database credentials, or even um, use some other features of Vault. This simple plugin allows you to consume the capabilities of Vault by managing authentication to Vault using AWS IAM, which is the role that the function runs on. And you can optionally render the secrets to disk upon function invocation. How does it work? There are two ways to include the extension in your function. If your function is deployed as a zip archive, you can include the layer in your function using the console or CLI and specify the following ARNs in the layer. If you use Terraform to deploy your Lambda function, then the AWS Lambda function resource also supports adding layers into it. If your Lambda function is deployed as a container image, then you can fetch the binary from releases.hashicorp.com place it in the slash op slash extensions directory of your image in the Docker file. When the Lambda function starts up, um, the execution environment, it will execute any extensions that it can find in that directory. You also need to set some environment variables in your Lambda function. Minimally, you will want to specify your vault address and the authentication role which is used by the function to authenticate to vault. If you choose to render the secrets to disk, you can specify the file path to write the secrets to. The complete set of environment variables um, that you can configure is found in the documentation, which I've included at the end. What happens after you configure the extension? There are two ways you can retrieve your secrets from here. The first way is to have the secrets written to disk by specifying that path in the variable we saw earlier. The extension will authenticate to the Vault cluster. It will retrieve the secrets at invocation and then write the secrets to disk prior to the function executing so that secrets can be retrieved and ready before the function runs. There are some considerations to this approach. Firstly, by way of AWS best practices, you want to avoid storing data in the execution environment. Well, secondly, you also want to consider the life cycle of your secret. If the same execution environment is used many times to invoke the same function code, um, perhaps to reduce code startup times, then there is a possibility that 
the dynamic secrets with short TTLs would have already expired. Ideally, we want the lifetime of the secret to be tied to the function and not the execution environment. This brings us nicely to the NITS method, which is also the recommended approach, which is to use the local proxy server. This server listens on port 8200 on local hosts. It forwards any request to the same path on the remote vault server. The local host port itself will be unauthenticated, but the extension will still use the AWS IAM auth with the remote vault server. So responses from vault will be proxied back without modification, and the extension acts as a simple authenticated pass through for the Lambda function. Why or when should you use the local proxy server? Firstly, if you use features like provision concurrency for your function, or you know that the execution environment could outlive the TTL of your secret, then the expiry of dynamic secrets would be a concern and using the local, prox local proxy server would help to mitigate that. And furthermore, you can avoid setting long TTLs to your secrets if you use the proxy server. Secondly, if you, use, if you want to use the transit or transform secrets engine to do encryption, then the local proxy server would help with that. And finally, this follows AWS security best practices, as there's almost no state tied to the execution environment, and it reduces the attack surface for exposing secrets as they are no longer written to disk. One other feature that I like to call out is caching. You can configure caching to avoid forwarding every request to the vault server. This can be helpful to not strain your resources where there are high rates of calls and is also expected to improve the performance. Caching could either be configured as an explicit opt-in at the request level so that it is only enabled for scenarios where caching makes sense without negative impact in others. And to turn that on, you would set the environment variable vault default cache TTL. When you do so, requests with HTTP method of get and the X vault cache control header will be returned directly from the cache if there is a cache hit. On a cache miss, the request will be forwarded to vault and the response will be returned and cached. Caching could also be enabled for all requests if you set the environment variable vault default cache enabled to true. Then all your requests will be fetched or cached as though the header that we saw earlier was present. You can also set it to no cache if you have this configured to opt out of caching entirely. Let's move on to a demo to see this in action. On my left is my Lambda function written in Python, and I've configured it to use the vault Lambda extension layer. By doing, to configure it, I have used the ARN vault Lambda extension here. I've also set certain environment variables for my Lambda function, such as my vault address, the authentication provider, which is AWS, the authentication role that I've configured in my vault server, as well as the file path that I want to write my secrets to, which is slash temp slash vault secret dot JSON, and where the secrets are retrieved from um, the mount path on database inside my Vault, inside my vault server. In my vault server here on the right, you can see that I have enabled the AWS authentication method. And this authentication method has this role that I have configured in my environment variable here. This role is configured to use the IAM role that my Lambda function runs on under permission. And it's also given a vault policy called Lambda function. Let's have a look at what this policy does. See, this is my policy called Lambda function. And it's given the capabilities on all these mount paths that I will be accessing in my function code. Let's have a closer look at my function 
So the first part, I am authenticating to the vault local proxy server, which is at 127.0.0.1 at port 8200. Then I will firstly read some KV secrets using the local proxy server, which passes through my request to the vault server. I'm reading it at the mount point KV and at the path secret, and I should expect the value of the key which is named to be returned here. If I do a list of all my vault secrets, you can see that I have the KV secrets engine mounted at the KV path with the secret with the key secret inside. And the data inside is the key is name and the value is John. So we expect John to be returned um, from lines 15 to 17 when we print it. The next part, we're looking at the transit secrets engine. Over here, I am, I will be encrypting the plain text, some plain text of using the key ring, my key inside of my Bob server. So against the transit secret engine, which is mounted at transit, I'm doing a list of the keys that I've enabled and my key is being used in my function code. And this is the configuration of the key ring. So over here, I expect that when I send this plain text to be, to be encrypted by the transit secret engine, it should return the cipher text. Next, we'll look at the database secrets engine. Over here, we're not using the local proxy server, but rather we are reading it from the Lambda functions execution environments disk. So where it is written to is slash temp slash vault secret, which is a local file path that we configured in our environment variable earlier. So my database secrets engine is mounted on the database path. And I have configured it to use um, the Postgres plugin. And I have set it to be connected to my RDS database um, with the PostgreSQL database plugin. And I have given it a role called Lambda function. with the following um, permissions and TTL. So all that has been configured in my environment variables, which I showed earlier. I'm reading against my database credentials, Lambda functions and point, and I'm writing it to this local file path. So let's invoke the function and see what happens. You can see that I have read my KV secret under the path KV secret. And I've given the name equals to value and we have retrieved the value of John using the local proxy server. Then I have also encrypted some plain text data here, also using the local proxy server, which forwarded our request to the transit endpoint. I have returned the cipher text in my um, Python code. And finally, the last part, we have retrieved the database secrets. Um, instead, from, instead of using the local proxy server, we wrote it to uh, this vault secret.json path. And we, are, we can see that dynamic database credential was created for the username and password for my RDS database, um, given that short TTL written to this so that my function can use it later on uh, for certain actions. So we have seen how Lambda functions can easily integrate with your vault to do things like dynamic database credentials, static KV secrets, or using the transit secrets engine, using either the local proxy server or having the secrets written to disk. And I'll leave you with some supporting documentation. If you'd like to try out the function on your own, we have a learn guide, which is the second link here. Um, we also have the GitHub repository and both HashiCorp and AWS have more supporting documentation um, regarding the extension.
Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day ahead.